Hello and welcome to Cracking the Cryptic. Um, today what I'm going to do is go through uh, the solution to a listener crossword, more just explaining how the end game worked than really solving the crossword in full. Now this was crossword number 4531, as I say it was from um, early December 2018. Um, Happy New Year to you by the way. Um, this was called Superpower by Shenanigans. Now I've never heard of Shenanigans, that's not a name I know. Um, the crossword was good enough that makes you wonder whether it might have been some other regular compiler under a new pseudonym. That does happen sometimes. Now, the first thing to notice is that the grid has no bars or numbers in it. Complete carte blanche grid, as we would call it. Um, and the next frightening thing about this, normally with a carte blanche puzzle, you would get clue numbers. You do at least get lengths of answers, but... Unfortunately, across and down clues are each given in alphabetical order of their answers, which must be entered where they fit. So as well as being a carte blanche, it's a form of jigsaw as well. Um, I really recommend compilers not to make puzzles that are carte blanche jigsaws. It's just too hard to just give a bunch of clues without telling solvers where they go or anything about their order. Now, the two things we have slightly helpful here are alphabetical order of their answers, which is very standard for jigsaw puzzles, but also they've been divided into acrosses and downs, and that's very useful. Now, there's another couple of bits in the preamble that matter. When taken in normal clue order, so to achieve that, you have to work out how they're going to fit into the grid, and then um, reorder the clues by what their numbers would be, if you like. Um, when taken in normal clue order, the corrections to the misprints in every clue spell out an extract from a source whose name appears consecutively among the initial letters of the clues, also in normal order. So you're really going to have to sort out the uh, the clues into the order that they would appear in if the crossword had been presented in normal order. Now, to people who don't like um, themed and uh, advanced cryptics, this is just going to appear like, why would you give yourself all that trouble? But it, when you get towards the solution, it does make it a bit more fun in some ways. An unclued entry, so there's also one unclued entry in the puzzle. Um, contains the theme, solvers must highlight two other representations of it in the grid. And that's really all. That we, we are also told the grid displays 180 degree symmetry. So if we do get anything started, the bar pattern will replicate um, with symmetry. And that's quite helpful. Now, as I say, I'm not going to go through the clues. Here they all are. If you want to pause the video and have a go at the puzzle yourself, you're very welcome. Please note that this grid is a 13 columns by 14 rows grid. And what I'm just going to do is point out that there's quite a few answers beginning with A. And here's something very interesting that, that's worth spotting early on. Um, this clue here, sorry, I don't know if I can highlight just the one clue. No, apparently not. Right, but the clue beginning novel, novel source of energy found in active atomic element 32. Well, there are a number of points there that regular advanced cryptic solvers will spot. Source of energy. Um, yes, it could be um, a battery or a dynamo. It could sometimes be the letter E being the first letter or source of the word energy. Um, but... Here it's actively it's actually gas. Active can often translate as the letter A, because that's an abbreviation in Chambers Dictionary, and atomic is also an abbreviation uh, uh, is also abbreviated to the letter A in Chambers Dictionary. So that's actually possibly giving AA. And once you know there's lots of A's in this, the novel that is seven and two words, it's not, an, it's not an individual novel, it's a type of novel. And crossword solvers are fairly familiar with the Arga Saga, 
um, if only because it's quite an intriguing palindrome um, and quite an amusing um, metaphor in a way. It's it's a saga about or to be read by people who have augers, so a kind of upper middle class novel <laughs> in some ways. Um, and the source of energy here is gas. You put that in between those two A's for active atomic, you get a Arga Sa. So you need GA from element 32. Now, intriguingly, if you look up your periodic table, gallium, which is GA, is actually element 31. So in fact, the misprint here isn't a letter. And if we go back to the preamble, it didn't say every clue contains a misprint of a single letter, which it sometimes says. It says every clue contains a single misprint. So some of them are numbers, and that's quite interesting. And here, the, the correction is the number one. Um, something, I mean, and we can carry that on because twice more in the clues, we have numbers in the clues. Here we have remedy for clot. Now that looks like a kind of medical definition. Appleby at the outset put a favourable slant on curbing independence with Chancellor's number 11. Well, that's an incredibly long clue. But, and it's sort of referring to Yes Minister on TV. Um, where Sir Humphrey Appleby was a main protagonist. But Appleby at the outset, that looks to me like the letter A in crossword ease. Like at the outset, the word Appleby is the letter A. Um, put a favourable slant on, so we kind of need some definition for that. Curving in, curbing independence with Chancellor's number 11. And I mean, this is pretty, pretty complicated stuff. But once we know that 11 could easily be misprinted here, and we can see that there are only 10 letters in Chancellor. Well, it kind of tells us that we might be looking for the 10th letter, the R. And if we ever manage to come up with the idea that to put a favourable slant on is to spin, then we've got A and spin curbing. That means going around, covering. Um, I for independence and R for Chancellor's number 10. And that will give us aspirin, which as well as um, relieving headaches, is a remedy for clotting. So it's a very long clue and it's very high. Frankly, I didn't come up with that cold, I can assure you. But it's very useful to kind of work out that that is aspirin. Um, and you get, again, a zero from this clue as the misprint, which is interesting. Now, that might mean an O, but it probably means a zero. You can't you kind of imagine the clue wouldn't have been contrived so much if you wanted just an O. And then further down, we've got number 10. And in fact, it's another Yes Minister style clue about Sir Humphrey Appleby. Elders started at number 10 in difficulties with Sir Humphrey Appleby initially as God. Um, I can't honestly remember what this is, but... Number 10 in difficulties, in fact, translates as the 11th answer. So number 11 in difficulties, um, which is, what is that? That's the letter E, in fact. With Sir Humphrey initially, gives us the letters SH. There's an old word for started or began, which is just GAN. And then you use GAN. The number 10 in difficulties is E and SH, and you get Ganesh, who's one of the, uh, also known as Ganesha, is uh, a Hindu god. So the answer to that clue is Ganesh, and um, the misprint is that number 10 becomes number 11, so you get a 1 as the misprint. I mean, that's pretty complicated stuff. Now, the way to actually get going on solving the grid here is to have a go at the long ones. And I think this this one here, bars with poles, may work to broadcast TV literacy with a bit of translation superimposed. Broadcast is quite a key word here because that's often used as an anagram indicator. If you broadcast seed, you spread it around. So if you spread the letters of TV literacy around here, um, and you also use T, which is a bit of translation, the very first bit. Um, 
I think that's enough letters to give you attractively. Or maybe it's with A and B and T. Um, and so attractively is the answer. How is that clued by bars with poles may work too? And even assuming that we have a misprint in there, it's quite hard to spot it. But once you start thinking about magnets, which can be bars with poles on, then you might realise that they may work in an attractive fashion or so. And in fact, the misprint there is the letter T becomes an S. The definition is bars with poles may work so. And you get attractively out of the anagram. I mean, that's pretty convoluted. But if you can get that, and as I say, you know it comes after aspirin. So it's quite likely to begin with an A or a B because these answers are in alphabetical order. And that can um, give one a bit of a chance to, to get it. And the other 12 letter answer is down here, which is obviously going to be symmetrical with that one. And this one is one who creates volcanoes, say, tossing pitch stone awry without a peak. Well, pitch stone is very suspicious and awry looks like another anagram indication. So, or in fact, no, tossing actually, that, that's a possible anagram indication. So if you take the letters of pitch stone and awry and you remove two of them, a and something implied by peak. You can get pyrotechnist, which is a maker of fireworks. You might know that a volcano is a, a type of a firework, unsurprisingly perhaps. But that does require peak to give us the letter W, and this is where the misprint comes into play because weak is one of the chambers um, explanations of the abbreviation W. I think in physics it can mean weak. So the misprint we get from that is a W. Um, we take the letters of pitch stone awry, remove a W and we get pyrotechnist. Now once you've got quite a few of these answers and you really do have to quite cold solve a few clues to get there, you can eventually come up with this grid of this is the um, form of the grid once it's got its bars in. And frankly, I think it would have been more helpful to provide this from the outset. I don't see why, why that couldn't have been done for this puzzle. It, it did make it very hard. Um, and with the answers to the clues, we can then finally fill in the grid. As you can see, Arga Saga's up here, attractively down there. We've got Pyrotechnist there. Um, what are the other clues we saw? Ganesh and Aspirin, they actually happen to be one, two, and three down that we've all just had a look at there. And the whole grid fit, fits together like this. Now, the unclued entry that was mentioned, appropriately enough, is kind of the only symmetrical one, that, that, or the one in the middle that doesn't have a symmetrical counterpart, is this word Googleplex. And once you've reordered all the clues into the normal crossword order, what is spelt out by them is this definition of Googleplex, one followed by a Google of zeros, 10 to the power of, of a Google. That's what was spelt out. So we know that this is kind of the theme of the puzzle now. That's, that's from Chambers, that definition. Um, and it also features in, in the same head word, Google, uh, which is obviously the origin of the word Google for um, the search engine. It also defines Google as one followed by 100 zeros, 10 to 100. Now, the last bit of the preamble that we have to focus on here said that um, we solvers must highlight two other representations of Googleplex in the grid. So now we need our kind of knowledge of maths to apply. And let's just move that to the side. So we need to find um, two other representations of Googleplex in the grid, which would be <clears throat> one with this incredible number of zeros um, after it, which, you know, is presumably that's 
you know, it says one followed by a hundred zeros. But then this is ten. I mean, it's just an extraordinary high number. But uh, we can reduce that ten to the power of a Google, and that's quite useful because we can see in the grid that as well as Google within Googleplex going down here. We've also got the letters of Google going across from here, G-O-O-G-O-L. And that is sitting just to the top right of the letters of 10. Ooh, sorry, I didn't need to do that. The letters of 10 in the word eten here. That's very annoying. So, I don't know what's going on with my puzzle here, sorry. Never mind, never mind about that E. But what we have to highlight is the letters of 10 here, T E N, and Google here, because that's showing us 10 to the power of a Google. And that's one of the representations. But the other one is more figurative. And just as we were wondering whether we were getting I's or O's from the misprints, now in the grid we can find a bunch of I's and O's up here. And if you look here, you've got I O, so if we assume that that can mean 10, that's to the power of 10 to the power of 100. So we have to also highlight those seven cells to show 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 100, which is obviously 10 to the power of a Google, given that a Google is 10 to the power of 100. So those are the two representations of it in the grid. And I mean, <laughs> It's a very clever idea. It's a very neat puzzle. As I say, I don't think it needed to be quite so hard, but uh, also difficultly presented um, with no clue numbers and so on. But that's really very neat. And it's a nice find. It's a very well represented puzzle. I was very impressed by shenanigans. I like the title of the puzzle as well, which is uh, Superpower. So all in all, it's a really clever listener and a lovely finish. Um, do you know? I do urge you to have a go, maybe at some of the easier um, listeners. But for a finish like that, it's certainly worth going through a bit of trouble. Um, a fascinating puzzle. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again on Cracking the Cryptic soon. Bye for now.